Yeah, so I don't know if you know about Seven Partnership. We are 45 members of staff, been going about 30 odd years. And I think users of Enforce for at least 20 of those, if not a bit longer. So a lot longer than I, I've been in the company for about 15 years and it was well established when I started. Um, as a company, we try and cover most bases. So we're, we're a survey firm, Geomatics, but we've, we've got a mobile mapper, Pegasus 2. Uh, we've got a subsurface department, so we do scan to BIM. And we're just getting started with aerial surveys because um, we were early adopters in static laser scanning back in the early 2000s. And we were early adopters with mobile mapping, but the first Pegasus in the UK, only the second Pegasus 2 in the world. Um, and we looked at UAVs and I think came to the conclusion that, yep, there was a lot of competition and let, let it settle down before we got started. So we've been doing it for six months now. Um, and it's good to hear that we think some of the early battles are um, overcome. We've got the same battles with mobile mapping, uh, accuracies and so on. There are some lower accuracy systems. There are non-survey companies, shall we say, that uh, buy the system for mapping, but it won't necessarily be survey. It's a survey-grade system, but you don't necessarily get survey-grade data out of the box. You need to uh, know what you're doing and the, the the core skills that we learnt as surveyors are very much applicable to to mobile mapping as well as anything else and you need to know what you're looking at to get the right data out because uh, it looks good but it might not be good um, oh that's not worked out very well I wrote this last night um, yep yeah, so for us, survey grade deliverables, we reckon there's 80%, mobile mapping will do 80% of the job, and 20% is other stuff. That's ground control, that's infill survey, it might be static scanning, it might be going out of the tape measure uh, and field checking. And one thing we've learnt over, we, we bought the Pegasus 2 in 2014, and it came with software called Map Factory from Leica, uh, it's okay, uh, it works inside ArcGIS. ArcGIS is not survey grade, it's, um, it's GIS grade, it's, it's good at GIS, but it's, I wouldn't say it's a survey package. So uh, we very much believe that survey grade hardware needs survey grade software. We've, we've used um, point tools, we've used MicroStation, we've used um, Revit, we've used Cyclone an awful lot, uh, Map Factory. Uh, we've tried everything, and what we're trying to do is get something else to do what Enforce does which is what we kind of realised, actually, what we want is Enforce. And back then, I know Phil was, Point Clouds were coming, and it was very early, and we had some early early beaters, and we, we literally could not wait to get Point Clouds inside Enforce, because that's the core of our company, as surveyors. That's what we use, it's what the total station data goes into, it's what, um, it's what our final product comes from. Um, and what we wanted to do was have all the final products in one place so we could see them all together, overlay them, make sure the static scans, the mobile scans, the, the modelling, um, the topo survey, the extracted CAD all matched up and layers, layer names were correct, line styles, annotation styles, everything was, was matched. Um, <coughs> and, and all our, our um, IMS, our integrated management system, is built around survey workflows, survey quality checks. We've had to modify it for mobile mapping to introduce some um, additional checks and balances, but essentially um, what we're trying to produce for 90% of our clients is fully annotated plan on a drawing layout. Um, and that for us comes from Enforce, so that's why we want to do the drawing. And certainly we, we were talking to um, Leica about the Pegasus and things we wanted to be able to do in the processing software, and they kept saying, but why? But why? And they're asking that, because they the, the, the people developing software weren't surveyors. Um, they didn't really understand what we were trying to do. Um, the photo, by the way, that's um, it's an RAF base, and, and they wanted sub 10 millimeter accuracy. Um, and, and again, going back to the core principles, the only way to get sub 10 mil is make sure your survey control is a lot better than sub 10 mil. So we were looking for sub 5 mil for our ground control, which meant half second instrument, mini prisms. Um, Putting clear, so so that that the, the the spray paint there, we weren't allowed to put nice big GCP spray marks on the runway, um, but we could sharpen up the corners of existing marks. But we had to make sure it was very very clear with the template, coordinated with the mini prism, so that we were happy that that ground control point was good to at least five mil or better, and then drive slow enough that we could see it in the point cloud to extract it to five mil or better. 
to try and maintain the accuracies. And it's all the core principles. But um, if you weren't a survey company, you'd struggle to even put the survey control network into 5 mil, let alone get a final CAD model out to that. Um, and it's an awful lot more work than you, you, you'll, you'll scan it in an hour, but there's probably two weeks, three weeks worth of work to get something out of it that's usable. Um, the first project, I was going to say, I've got three projects, and they're all kind of an example of Enforce for us is the melting pot of geospatial data to get the final product out. It doesn't actually matter what we use, uh, we want it to go into Enforce um, to, get, to get put together. So, our, our first one is high output track renewals. Um, HOTR as we call it, so we're on a five-year framework at the moment. Um, nationally, so there's seven regions of the UK, we're doing all seven. Uh, this train, there's two of these trains, they're one mile long. Within network rail as, as a whole project, there's 1,200 staff, 50% are subcontracted in. There's 800 staff on site every single week manning this, this, these two machines. And they, they do three quarters of a mile per night per train of renewals which is slow, it's walking pace, but actually that's 1.5 miles of renewals a night every single night of the week. That's quite a lot to survey, doing it traditionally. So 15 years ago when I joined the company, I was out daytime, I had a cost ticket, lookouts, top station, track foot. And I could just about get a mile a day done, eight, eight track setups if I got on with it. But if the cost was late, the weather was bad, um, network rail decided we couldn't work for some reason, you'd lose a day, lose half a day. You'd lose an hour here, an hour there, and you very rarely got a clean week. Nowadays, it's night shifts only, four nights a week, Monday, th Monday Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, average four to five hours a night, compared to we were doing 12-hour days back then, and then it all happens on a Saturday night. So we've, we've lost 60 70% of our track access, um, and yet we still need to get 1.5 miles of survey delivered every single day of the week um, to keep this train moving. And if that train stops... <coughs> Uh, toys fly. Um, so we teamed up with Fugro. They've got a train mounted mobile mapping system. So there's actually on the front of that train there's two systems. There's Ryler Track and Ryler 360. They're both GPS IMU system with a laser. Ryler Track is close range laser. It gets a very accurate profile of the rail head which we can then um, auto extract the track alignment from. And Ryler 360 is too big um, ZNF profile is bolted on the front. Separate system, but the rails in the 360 scan are matched to the rails in the, the Ryler track scan and two bolted together. They've updated it now. They've got a, a lighter weight Rigel scanner on the, on the track system to remove the two big profiles off the front, but it, it's not as good. Um, two big scanners is a lot better for, from a surveyor's perspective for the quality of the data. Um, but we still, uh, that, that runs, they'll do um, you know, 100 miles in a day. They'll run four times on every single track, smooth out the accuracies. Um, the difference with this is that there's no ground control, so it is mobile mapping. Uh, with four runs, they can get down to about 12 millimeter absolute accuracy, which is does not meet network rail band one accuracy, plus minus five mil. But network rail has said it's good enough. Um, and it's come to a point now where they say, um, can you justify putting 10 track survey teams out for the, for, to go from 12 mil to 5 mil accuracy. Nine times out of 10, the engineers can't. But what we know as surveyors is some things they are interested in that's very critical. So the distance between the track, the six foot distance, the passing clearance of the trains, the clearances through a tunnel, critical. Um, joints and welds, we can't see in the point cloud. So we survey those traditionally. And the site techs who are doing a lot of the construction, um, the one thing they want is a site chainage. So we still go to site and mark up on the rail every 10 metres a chalk mark and write the chainage on manually. With all the technology, they still want that. Can't get away from it. Um, but again, this is 80% less time on site. Um, we, we get from those, that system, the system blows the Amberg IMS 5000 trolley. Um, the IMU, it's got an IMU on it, so that, that's the latest bit of kit. We've got one without an IMU as well, but essentially the output is the same. It's rails and a point cloud, and that's what we bring into Enforce to then get the final deliverable out, which is all the um, topographic detail and so on. Uh, we do gauging from the point cloud, and we also do heights and staggers, which is uh, the, the overhead wires, the, the XY offset relative to the track centre line is measured at the registration point of the gantry and halfway, <clears throat> and that's um, basically dictates... If they move the track too much, they need to move the wire, and they, so they want to know where it is. But again, go from, we go from a 3D um, point cloud to a 
Excel spreadsheet as a final deliverable. So I wouldn't say the engineers are behind, but they're refusing to use the 3D data. They've got the spreadsheets, that works, don't change it. So we've got to come up with the workflows. We need to know how to do it the old way so that the new way matches and it's seamless for on, on their end. Uh, which has been an interesting um, exercise. It probably took us 18 months to get NetRL to accept us using point clouds for height and stagger, but they now do. Um, that wasn't supposed to be in big bold, can we have auto wire? That was in small text <coughs> on my screen. Um, but that, that would help our workflows. If we could all, we had a little meeting before. Yeah. <laughs> if we could also extract the wires. So we, um, the one thing we've learned is if you change software packages, you need to export a point cloud, you need to import a point cloud. That takes time. Um, the more we can do in one place, by far the better. Um, so at the moment <coughs> we go to um, 3D reshape to do wire extraction. They've got a really nifty little algorithm put the point cloud in and within seconds we've whipped out a wire where the wires cross and things we need to go in and check and untangle it but it gets rid of a lot of effort um, if, if that was inside Enforce that would save us on every site probably an hour which you know we're doing a couple of these sites every day um, it make life you, that, the, the, those are little things which speed things along as soon as you go outside of the core workflow you, it's another QA procedure and it's another export it's another import um, it's another software license I've got to maintain uh, I'd rather give the money to Phil. <laughs> uh, I'll give it to Tom. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep, so we, we merge it. This is a tunnel, um, bowling tunnel near Bradford, if anyone's from that way. Um, this isn't actually from, this is from a trolley based system, the Amberg trolley. So it's a more of a profiler, but we're, we're doing um, 100 profiles a second at walking pace. You end up with a pretty good point cloud. We extract it, but what we, do, what we like to do is we extract all the topo detail, extract the rails, extract the clearance profiles. We like to have a look at everything together as surveyors just to make sure it all matches up. There's nothing oversimplified or mismatched. Um, and nothing's been missed in the dark. So the good thing about, well, the bad thing about railways is you have to work at night. The good thing about point clouds is that they can see in the dark. And generally, if you can see it in a point cloud, you don't miss it. And we've got much more confidence in our final, final deliverable. Um, is it better? So I put 70% there. It varies site to site on the length of it and so on. 70 to 80% less time on site. Um, office processing increases by the equivalent 70%. But we're working eight and a half hours a day, five days a week. Unless someone's sick or the computer's crashed, then generally we get pretty good productivity. It's much more manageable. And less people on site's a good thing. Um, training's easier. So... Um, Quite a lot of our surveyors now will get trained on digitising in a point cloud before they'll go out and do their own topo survey. Sounds counterintuitive, but they know the codes, they know what the end product should look like. Um, then they'll go and do a test, test uh, our car park survey, as we call it, and then they'll go out to site. Um, but it's definitely part of our training now, not just how to use Enforce and CAD and stuff, but it trains with it's virtual surveying. It does, does get some of the routines in there. And we're a bit more confident in our deliverables if we can see it all on screen with a 3D point cloud. The next project um, is a highways only project, um, so it's Curzon Street, so this is our Pegasus and that's our Amarok, uh, we put a hydraulic um, lift in it, it's just a, from a mechanics, an engine engine lift um, bolted in the back, that lifts the Pegasus up, it's got some stay wires to hold it in place and that's what we drive around in uh, for most of our highway stuff, the Pegasus is nice and high up, uh, but also being on the hydraulic thing we can drop it down if you go into a car park. We used to, <laughs> trust me, you get a cold sweat on if uh, you suddenly realise halfway in, you think, I've got to stop. Um, but, but it was uh, it actually, we did a project at um, Gatwick Airport to scan all the car parks and the road networks. And uh, at the time, we just had it on roof rails on top of a caddy van. But every car park, there was clearance, but we just weren't confident doing it. So what we found is we were taking it off, driving to the car park, putting it back on, reinitialising, scanning, taking it off, coming out of the car park, putting it back on. And it, it added you know, an hour to every car park. So we decided to put hydraulic lift in, it, it works. Um, so Curzon Street, it's the, it's the new HS2 in the middle of Birmingham. Uh, I, it's not my picture, I stole this off HS2 website. But it's a complex site, so we did the uh, the road going across the front of the station, kind of going around the side, where the railway line is um, sort of just south of the station, that's an existing railway line. They want to know exactly where the retaining walls were so they can butt up against it. Um, the station now is on top of, or will be on top of roads that are there now, uh, and there's road networks and stuff, things getting diverted. So we surveyed um, probably about 50% of what you can see in that picture, plus a bit more down here. 
Um, and the end product is a topographic survey. Um, so we've used lots of interesting techniques, but the client really was only interested in a 3D topographic survey and, a, and they wanted a DTM, um, a, a detailed DTM. So that's that's the DTM. Um, 80, so that's, that's our, and again, you can, you can create meshes or DTMs from point clouds. Um, <coughs> you tend to have things in there you don't want to have in a DTM. So we tend to extract the topographic detail, create the, D, the DTM from the topo survey as normal. But what we can now do, um, and then we'll do infill survey where we've got shadows or bushes. Um, we'll do site walkover. Things like manhole covers are difficult to see in point clouds, so we'll always survey those in. Um, there's always bits and pieces, 30% infill, field checking. Um, but what the client doesn't see, some do, but not in this case, um, is that's the mobile mapping data set. We extract the topo from that and then create the DTM from the survey. And the fantastic thing now is we can compare our final DTM to the point cloud inside Enforce, which sounds a little thing, but there aren't that many software packages you can do that in. Um, we, we use Cyclone an awful lot, Cyclone Survey. Um, we'd never issue a DTM out of Cyclone, um, not direct anyway, not without going through some cleaning and checking and stuff. But this was great. We could see areas where we'd maybe oversimplified the spot levels. We could add a couple of extra levels in from the point cloud and make sure the DTM tracks the point cloud accurately. There's no, there's no bits chopped off. Uh, got all our brake lines in the right place. So that, that made this project, apart from the fact the DTM is massive, and even with um, 8 gig um, GTX 1070 graphics cards, it takes a long time to load. The point cloud, sorry? Hmm? The point cloud. Uh, no, the DTM. It takes a long time. Even working with an SSD, a um, good graphics card takes a long time to load it. It's, it's big. This is only a, this is, what you can see here is probably about 10, 15% of the DTM. So it's a massive area. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite, a, quite a tight DTM, so quite small triangles. Um, yeah, to, to, it's still quite, it's quite heavy to load, but we're, same with everything. Um, we've, we've put it in other software and struggled as well. What sort of density of ground control did that mean? Um, we put a GCP every 50 metres. On each carriageway? Or? No. Um, try, we try to go down the middle. Um, <coughs> or we zigzag. Um, but largely it's more a case of where it's going to be clear, where it's going to get scanned well, where it's not going to get rubbed out. Because uh, the thing that slows us down now is getting the ground control in. The ground control takes longer than the scanning. Typically, you'd be the topo would be lagging way behind the, the survey. You whip through the survey control and do the topo. It's very much the other way around now. We're waiting to get out and scan, and we're waiting for the control to be done. To the point where now, sometimes we'll um, we, we generally we do pre-mark our ground control, so we'll spray up a, a diamond shape, and we, we might go up. Um, put little nails in and spray those up before we coordinate them so we can get the scan done because there's, there's a bit of pre-processing we need to match individual scan passes together before we tie it down to the ground control so there's a few days of uh, post-processing to do before we actually need the ground control so we'll, we'll go in and spray up as much as we can so all the survey control gets sprayed up and interim points as well which might be um, might, like the mini prism I showed you that's our most common method and we'll take, take a shot on two faces so it's a topo shot on two faces for something like this um, but yeah, it's getting those coordinates done typically is, is lagging behind us having the scan data. And then, and then the next thing is, is CAD extraction it is a big job. It, I wouldn't, it's quicker than surveying it manually in the field, but um, it's, not, it's not that much quicker to get a final product. So there's lots of tools out there to semi-automate things. And you'll see, you know, you'll see adverts where you can get a kilometre of road done in a, in a couple of hours. And, you know, click, click, white lines done in minutes. But that's not as deliverable. That's that's just one element of the survey. Um, curb lines are difficult with getting the drop curbs right, making sure you've got all your gullies, um, annotation. Um, simple things that uh, Enforce does really well, like the annotation, be able to list, select, um, switch heights on, off. Suddenly in something like MicroStation, it's just not as easy. So uh, for this job you used mm. Enforce to extract the data from the point yep. of Yep. All done in Enforce, um, and huh? <laughs> yeah, so um, we, we've got four CAD apprentices <laughs> who um, now want to be surveyors, but uh, but yeah, it's it's a real problem um, digitising. So it's a survey. I believe it's a surveyor's skill to get a final topographic drawing put together, uh, and the extraction. You need to think like a surveyor. How would you survey it in the field? 
Um, if you have a 3D modeler doing it, uh, we've got plenty of 3D modelers, it tends to get far too much detail, so they'll be chasing a curb, but they'll be chasing a curb every 100 mil, so it follows it perfectly. So if you're in the field, you do that every five meters, and right, you know, you get your tangent like points. Yeah, and it's it, it's it's having the right mindset. So it is it is a challenge. Um, and it's something we've probably put more effort into the digitising side of it than the the actual using the Pegasus is. Um, it's got a lot easier, and it's not it's not that difficult. You, know, you switch it on, you do initialisation, you, you drive around and scan. You need to have good logistics. Um, the post processing's got much better. You need to know what you're looking at. But to get a point cloud is quite quick. To actually then get a survey product out of it which is why you need survey grade software. You need to be able to have all these tools, do your sections, do your annotations, to put your topo infill in, to have it all together so that you're confident in the end product. Um, yeah, and that's, that's just a cross-section showing some of, the, some of the different levels. So that was, that was probably two months' work for us um, to get through it, which it would probably take two months to do traditionally, but you'd be, probably have four survey teams on it full-time. You'd have traffic management out. Um, so cost-wise, it's, it's certainly a lot cheaper. Um, Program-wise, well, one thing the expectation is, or you can just scan it in a day, so when can I have the survey? It is quicker, but it's not, it's not, it doesn't take a day to draw. It takes long, takes time. So it's, it's um, managing clients' expectations, which is same with static scanning back in the early 2000s, probably same with the UAV surveys uh, five, ten years ago. That was, it's managing what you can do. Um, and making sure you get the survey grow product. Um, third project, um, someone mentioned we haven't actually finished this one, um, so please don't go tweeting this one out. Um, but it's an interesting one, it's road and rail, there's um, 12 miles of rail, 10 miles of road. Um, track alignment had to be done with the trolley, um, it's fence to fence for the full length of the rail um, and up to the back of pavement for all of the highway detail. But it was all survey grade, so we had to put survey control network along the rail, along the road, one big GPS network, link it all in with the levelling. Um, and there's quite a lot of topo infill, particularly on fence to fence on a railway embankments, making sure you get your top and toe of the bank and stuff, any culverts. Um, and on the highway, again, inspection covers would always topo in because uh, you can miss them in a point cloud very easily. Uh, so on track, we used something called an Aquarius Land Rover road rail um, vehicle, um, really good company. If you need to get one of these, they're a fantastic company to work with. They, they built that frame, for, or they modified that frame, they had, they had it for something else, and they modified it so they'd get our Pegasus on, which welded some extra bars just in the right place, which made life a lot easier. But we had uh, two Sunday shifts, um, Sunday blockade for 90% of it. Part of it was, um, it's just going to Liverpool, it's got the DC lines, third rail, going to the metro system. Um, so that had to be a separate shift, otherwise we'd have done the whole lot in one one Sunday day. Uh, we drove um, two passes on each each track. Uh, we only, to be honest, you could do it just one drive through, but we quite like having um, three or four scans so you can compare them all and just make sure that there's nothing way off. Again, we had ground control. We had our <coughs> permanent survey control every 200 metres, concreted in, and then every 50 metres we put a GCP down, sprayed it up coordinate it with the mini prism and then pick it out the point cloud and that's what we use to tie the point cloud down so every 50 meters it's tied down and then the rails were done with an Amberg trolley um, network rail band 1a but we can then compare that to the rails from the point cloud as well just as an overall QA check it's quite a nice common feature that you can do um, plan and height checks throughout the length of it and that's one area of it um, this this image looks a bit different to the previous one. This was taken off a 4K monitor in our office. I'd recommend them. I was, I was amazed at the difference. Uh, it makes a huge, huge difference to be in the point cloud. You see a lot more detail. Um, Except for when we team you in, it makes it quite hard because yeah. you don't have 4K monitors. <laughs> 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 so you get some 4K monitors. <laughs> I know, yeah, well, I, I better get a word Somebody knows about that. that. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. You don't need two, you just need one main one and then a normal yeah, monitor. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, the, the amount of detail you can see in the point cloud is fantastic, especially if you do like cloud to cloud uh, registrations in Cyclone, you can see a lot more detail on a 4K monitor. Now everybody wants one, but uh, no, I, was, I was very impressed. But that's, um, uh, I think it's Fazer Curley Station uh, going up to, I oh, know it might be up Holland actually, going up to the tunnel at the northern end. But you can see um, we've got the, ro the road topo going over the top, rail topo, it's all digitised in M-Force. 
um, and the final model comes from Enforce. But the, the good thing about this project, or the interesting thing is, we have to do um, wireframe models of every bridge. So these were actually static scanned. So the mobile mapping data is good for Topo. Um, for a bridge, for, for something as complex as that, I probably wouldn't trust mobile mapping data. Uh, it's good, you can tie it down to the ground, you can get top out of it really nicely. But for lots of fine detail, you are moving, so the scan is just not as dense. So we did do four static scans for every bridge, um, and type that down to the ground control. But what we do then is drop that static scan data into Enforce to compare it to the mobile mapping data. And we use Revit to model the bridges. So the 3D team, they're fantastic, they make stuff look really, really good. They're not surveyors, so they, sometimes they don't look at things in the same way. The project manager for this is a surveyor. Um, he knows Enforce, and he wants to QA check these bridges. So the wireframes, we took the, the Revit model out, put it into AutoCAD, exploded the faces, got the wireframe out, and then put that into Enforce's dedicated backcloth. You can view it on top of the point cloud, on top of the topo. What you don't want is to have um, a topo foot of a bridge, a 3D model foot of a bridge, static scan data and mobile scan data all in slightly different places. Because if you measure something three times, you will get three different answers. So it's about making sure that what we issue is one answer and it all matches at the key points. Um, so being able to QA this on top of a point cloud inside Enforce with the topo is a real big plus for us. Um, it... Uh, at one point, we thought we were going to have to train all our project managers in 3D modelling just so that they could check the data properly, but this, this makes life a lot easier. Um, so sort of in a summary, um, we've got a lot of tools um, and workflows diverge. So UAVs <coughs> go through Agisoft, you'll, you'll get a mesh out, get a point cloud out, static scanning, cyclone, mobile mapping goes through um, Leica's own workflow. We've got utility surveys, um, we've got all our topo data. We want to get it all into one pot, not just to look at. We've been able to do that for some time, but actually process it and get the final product out of one, one pot. And that's what Enforce is starting to do now, which is, is fantastic. And every, every bit of hardware comes with its own bit of software, which, you know, it's, so some of it's specialist and it needs to have it, but uh, it's sometimes a bit of a bugbear of mine that it, I, you have to keep it up to date. Um, and do you actually need it? It's, there's a lot of overlap between software packages, and you, you, you want to be master of one um, rather than a jack of all trades. So we've got specialist teams that know certain areas better, um, but uh, we, could, we can lean on that Enforce much more heavily now. Um, and yeah, it's written in, so we've got an ISO 9001 quality system, and Enforce is, is named in there, and the tools within Enforce are named in there as to use this tool, we do this check, we do this check, and uh, we don't need to rewrite that now, which is good. Um, you know, we've tried a lot of different ways um, to digitise, and spent quite a bit of money on different, different software solutions, um, and we keep coming back to Enforce as this is where, we're, if it's a survey, great product so not all of it is that we've done asset management surveys we've got 3d modeling surveys um, we've got rights to light stuff going on um, but if it's a survey it's a survey deliverable uh, highways rail infrastructure for us um, then we want to use Enforce. Um, so if survey and, and the things we're trying to do in other software we realize oh, this is what Enforce does we're trying to get stuff back in there uh, so we're finding it a really useful tool uh, that was it whip through it probably less than half an hour Perfect. but Perfect. yeah Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. You're doing your processing in your CAD side. How much <coughs> more CAD now do you think you do in Enforce for, uh, for, for a topo? For a topo? Oh, at 80 90%. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we do use MicroStation and we share a topo dot license, but we don't actually use that in house. Um, it's We work with another company to help us on some of our bulk digitising. Um, they're not, not not over in India, but they're just um, they're just a partner company that is using MicroStation. Um, but we still take the stuff out of MicroStation and put it into Enforce to get a final final product. Uh, so yeah, so even with some of the kind of the high end solutions out there, we still prefer going through Enforce. So Do you use Jetstream at all? No, no. Mainly because our, we've not really had a, a need for it. Um, we, we do use CloudWorks as a plugin. Uh, but just not with Jetstream. Um, we've got a pretty good network, and it, it runs quite well over that. We're not. We're only one office as well. We're forty odd people. We're one office in Telford, so we're not trying to send data all over the place. 
Where you're not laser, where you're not mobile mapping. Yeah. So take the first example job, the, the highways and adjacent to the station. Yeah. Were there areas of that that you didn't capture with the mobile mapper? But yeah. But then, do you only go in with total station, or would you go in with terrestrial laser scanners? Yeah. To terrestrial laser scanning. So I mean, that's what we did on. Um, so this bridge. We have mobile mapping data on it, but we terrestrial scanned it to get the level of detail. Um, and yeah, working back to... But in uh, a more top, typical topo environment, would you revert to laser scanning, just have common point cloud data rather No, than no we don't. It's, we're not point cloud only. Um, it's the right tool for the job. Um, you can get... It's sometimes... Um, sometimes surveyors will get carried away with the scanning side of it and they want to scan everything. But actually, if you add up the amount of time that you've got to process that just to before you even start digitising, you might be better off just doing a topo. Uh, so culvert surveys are a classic one. Um, our surveyors always want to scan them because it gets all the fiddly detail. Um, but it doesn't actually take that long to scan a culvert, to, to topo a culvert. So, uh, but in a lot of complex area like that, you end yeah. up with the decisions on where you cut off between knowing that you've got data by one source and then having yeah, to go Yeah, so it's very much on the workflows. So that kind of 80, 20, 70, 30, you'll get eight, 70, 80% from scanning. But we'd always do a walkthrough looking for things that are missed. Uh, I mean, scanning is great for complex building footprints in a topo, um, staircases, things like that, stuff that we slow to do. Um, but spot levels on a car park, um, top and toe embankments, we'd always just survey those traditionally. Um, it's, it's very much sort of horses for courses. Yeah. Uh, but it is it's very much on the workflow side, you can waste a lot of time. Uh, if you've got a, a small visibility splay going 20 metres each way, we probably wouldn't get the mobile mapper out unless we had 20 of them to do and we could scan them all in a day because the, the effort of getting the scanner out there, scanning it, tying it down, then digitising it, you'd probably topo it quicker. So it's, it's, it's finding the right balance. Um, and presumably on something, a, a large project, like that, you've actually got to get your topo guys out doing some of that infill before you've necessarily got all yeah. of your data extraction done from the cloud anyway. Yeah, so, so there's things we know we'll miss. So we, like I said, manual covers is a big thing. We'd always go and um, <coughs> sur survey those in. Um, Overgrown embankments, we say, right, so for the rail, for example, uh, we got them started pretty quickly, saying get, get the top and toe of the bank all the way through the section because it's overgrown, we're not going to scan it. Um, and it's very much a workflow thing, and it's trying to work through sections, uh, which is why I want to scan it probably before the control's done, such that we can get the, the point clouds prepared, as soon as the control's done, tie it down, get the digitising started, uh, we can start doing infill of things we know we've got to infill, and then three quarters of the way through digitising when things start to get tidied up, take that plan out and do a walkthrough and just make sure there's nothing obvious missing. Um, and it's, it is an iterative. And this is where you need to be a surveyor, I think, to understand what you're trying to, end, to achieve at the end to get the, get the workflows right. Because um, you will miss stuff. Yeah. And it's having a mobile mapper, you tend to you get exposed to an awful lot of different types of work, asset mapping and stuff. Um, and the temptation is to try and do everything. But actually, and I'm probably saying with UAVs, there's all sorts of inspection work and filming and stuff that you can get involved in. But where I think we add value and can charge our full rates is survey great stuff like this, which you wouldn't want to do if you weren't a survey company. Because it's, it's complex and it's delivered to HS2 and they're going to go through it with a fine tooth comb. Which but you didn't. can also extract much more data from mm. cloud for mobile mapping than you would ever have picked up using traditional methods so yeah. again whenever you work with one cloud you couldn't know where to draw the line and what you're actually absolutely from. absolutely and again that's a big part of our training is making sure that um, it's it, the end product is a survey so don't model every curbstone the engineer is not really interested um, we need to um, so again with the DTM if we tried to do a DTM um, from the point cloud for the road surface okay you'd have every pothole every that the crown all nice and curved, but um, chances are the, the client won't be able to use it if, it, if it's, a, it's a mesh that's, that's heavy. This is a pretty heavy mesh as it is, um, and, and if we'd had spot levels every um, 200 mil on the carriageway, that would have made it even heavier. So it's, it's making sure that we get the end product. You can spend a lot of time, and it's it, being efficient and getting it done to make sure you, you focus on the spec and what you need to do. There's a lot more that can be done, uh, which is why we always show our client, we sort of say, this is what you're getting, this is what you've asked us for, you can have that. Um, some want it, some don't. 
Um, and if they're not going to pay to have it, then, <laughs> you know, get on with delivering what they want um, as efficiently and accurately as possible and make sure you get the, the right bits right. Um, and there's a lot of distractions in, in mobile mapping and 3D data. You can go off down a rabbit hole and end up with something that probably isn't what the client wants quite, quite, quite often. Are you being exposed to snake grid coordinate systems? Yeah, loads. I've got a really good presentation on it. Um, <laughs> We've got time. <laughs> um, yeah, and um, see so the ability, I think, to apply transformations to point clouds is coming. That that would be really useful for us. Um, so one thing, I'm going sort of to the mobile mapping. Um, Sorry, is that presentation re regarding, like, are you accepting snake grids and m yet? No, <coughs> but if you remember, we put out an email late, earlier on this year asking for like a vote. I didn't barely remember last week. I didn't? Barely last week. Barely remember last week, okay, fine. Uh, we, we emailed something like, dead love to tell you, 200, 300 mm. emails. Mm. And I think we had about 50 emails basically saying yes, they'd be very, very interested in it. Mm. And we have started talks um, with UCL. Um, yeah, uh, licensing their yeah. their software. Yeah, yeah. I think well, the money goes in creating the DAT files to actually do the snake grid, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. It you does, can do, yeah. There's a free product to do it. You can actually convert for free, but it's just another process to do it yeah. outside of any course, But we will build it in. Yeah. So I mean, we use it all the time. Um, snake grids. So the route that rail project was on a snake grid, um, and but we do it all outside of M4. So it's part of our survey control um, to get our mobile mapping data onto another grid. So obviously it's GPS IMU, so it's on a projected grid. So it can go to a, a standard projection. We can go to dead easy within the Leica workflow because um, you just um, apply the projection to the trajectory and then the point cloud gets generated. But then you've got this massive point cloud that you want to, I don't know, make a pseudo OS, get scale factor one, or you want to go to a snake grid or a local site grid. And at the moment we've got to generate a grid of points over the whole survey area, take that out, run that through whatever snake grid or LGO or something to get them on the, the local grid, bring it back in, and then we can do a projection within the Pegasus software to, to project the point cloud and apply the scale factor change. It's a scale factor change that's difficult. Uh, we can do a shift and a rotation in a lot of software, but the actual applying the scale factor is a difficult bit. Um, if we can do that inside Enforce, that would save us, again, another another process outside of Enforce, and it would make life a lot easier. And, for QA, so part of our QA is if you're doing a, a transformation, take text file, you save the text file, and it's you know you write in what the text file is. This is a text file that I've used to do transformation. It all ties it together nicely, and it just it removes a whole other process. Um, but yeah, but the actual snake grid as a coordinate system is just a coordinate system. Um, it's it's just getting you, your control onto it. Um, this isn't, it's not difficult. It's just yeah, it's a separate workflow. Good. Okay. Right.